Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Footy Travellers Podcast. Mike, that game, buddy. Yeah, that was a game. It was a game. It was a game. Listeners, in case you missed it, and of course, depending on when you're listening to this episode, the latest iteration of USA versus Mexico just came and went pretty uneventfully. Most uneventfully, might I say. Yeah, that's uh, that's fair enough. It was probably the most uneventful, I guess it uh, it could be. We won't spoil it for you in case you didn't watch or haven't seen the scoreline, but I'm uh, fairly confident you could make a, a wager based on our reaction right now. It's like when your parents say, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Yeah, it was, uh, it was disappointing for sure, but not devastating. You know, of course, from an objective point of view, I guess it was just as disappointing for us as USA fans as it was for Mexican fans. Touche, yes. Whatever the Spanish version of touche is, I could say that as well. Um, They are certainly not celebrating any more than we are right now. You know, if we're not being so US-centric, we should probably recognize that there is also the Mexican fan perspective in this bitter rivalry. Yeah, it takes two to tango. So there is is the Mexican... End of the rivalry. You know what else? What is that? That is exactly what we're going to share in this episode. Ooh, you tricked me. You set me up for that. Listeners, in this week's episode, we're bringing you a conversation both Mike and I had earlier this week with an ardent Mexican national team supporter and a good friend of mine, Felipe Vieira. Felipe is going to share his origin story of becoming a fan, his views on the rivalry, He'll shed some light on his hidden gem travel spot in Mexico, and he'll reveal the adventure food industry's hottest new brand. Very tantalizing. That is a nice lead in, though I'm excited for you all to enjoy this episode. But first, let's do some quick housekeeping. Mike, do you want to lead us off? I love me some good housekeeping, even if I can't keep my house kept well. But here's the first thing we need to reveal. We have an adjusted schedule. Every two weeks, we are coming out with new episodes. So every other Friday, expect a new episode coming from us with the next one being revealed on April 8th. And of course, if you're listening to this episode, you're probably a fan. You know, this is our sixth episode. You're deep into it. You're committed. And we appreciate that. We would also appreciate it if you left us a follow and a rating. You can also share this with friends or, you know, maybe enemies. Maybe you're a bit of a masochist and you're just listening because you hate us. I don't know. I don't know what your vibe is. We hope it's good. If you're on Apple Podcasts specifically, go ahead and leave us a proper review as well. All of these things will help others find our show and you're a good person and you want to help others. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. What else should they do, Mike? They should do the easy thing which is follow us on Instagram. We've got a new Instagram handle. It is at footy travelers. That's F O O T Y T R A V E L E R S. Very simple to find us. We're posting all the time. Reach out to us that way. Tell us what you think. We're going to, we are doing a lot of uh, stories and polls and quizzes. So highly interactive. And feel free to DM us on that Insta page, you know, either to congratulate Mike on his excellent spelling or just share a reaction to something you heard. We've been getting a few things about episode four already, our decision to attend the World Cup. So if you have some thoughts and reactions there, join the party. Or just join the tally list of uh, people calling me out on words that I've made up so far. Uh, That's also a fun game that people have been doing. None of them, by the way, are valid on Wordle. Just a heads up. (laughs) Shout out to Wordle, future sponsor. All right, everyone. Without further ado, or again, whatever the Spanish version is for that word. Without. 
Freddy Adu. The Footy Travelers present to you Felipe Vieira. Well, Felipe, welcome to the show, my friend. I know we've talked about doing this for quite a while now. It's great to finally make it happen. Yeah, thank you for having me, Colin. I am excited to get into it. <laughs> We're also here with our co-host, Mike. My co-host, Mike, I should say. What's up, Mike? What's up? I'm glad we're uh, we're fi- I'm finally getting to meet the legendary Felipe that I've heard so much about. I'll brag about my friends anytime. <laughs> <laughs> now, we, the three of us, had a, a bit of a different plan for this conversation other than doing this virtually. You know, I think a few weeks ago, we were all talking about the hope of being in Mexico City for the USA-Mexico World Cup qualifier mm-hmm. in the Azteca seeing one of the most iconic matchups in international football, at least in my opinion, in one of the most iconic stadiums. Uh, But unfortunately, that didn't pan out for us. But nonetheless, here we are. So Felipe, of course, our friendship, you know, our connection is all thanks to the sport of soccer that we all love. You know, I've gotten to know you fairly well over the last several years through coaching, uh, you know, watching Champions League games together, probably when we should have been doing work. (laughs) Uh, Right. More than anything, though, I think you and I have really come to enjoy giving each other some shit when it comes to USA versus Mexico. Mm -hmm. Uh, But do us a favor, you know, for our listeners who don't know you all that well yet, tell us a little bit about who you are and your connection to the Mexican national team. You know, why do you love them so much in the first place? Yeah. First and foremost, thank you for having me here, Colin, and both of you for giving me the opportunity to hang out with you all and uh, share some space. But um, for your listeners, uh, my name is Felipe Vieira. I'm originally from Morelia, Michoacán, Mexico, um, which is the state of Mexico that produces the most avocados in the world. Uh, so if you're an avocado fan uh, listening, you're welcome. And it's also, the, we used to have a soccer team. It was the, the Monarch Butterfly. It, they were the Monarcas. They're not there anymore, but the Monarch, because Michoacán is one of the winter grounds for the Monarch Butterfly, um, the Western side, beautiful. Um, but I actually grew up in Colorado. So my family uh, and I immigrated to the States when I was two and then moved to Colorado, drawn by the prospect of well-paying jobs and affordable housing. My parents left to Mexico, settling down in the Front Range uh, in Fort Morgan and Greeley and growing up in this small blue collar town. I remember my parents working hard to get past the language barrier when it came to school for my brother and I, and my mom, especially working diligently to ensure she knew all that she needed to know when it came to school expectations from health shots, school registration, parent teacher conferences, extracurricular activities. Um, And one of those extracurricular activities that I was signed up for uh, was soccer and at that age, soccer was cool and all, but I was more into playing Pokemon and other video games uh, that kept me inside. And uh, But my parents insisted I play peewee soccer. But yeah, soccer didn't draw me in as much as catching a Pikachu did from the comfort of my couch and watching some Saturday morning cartoons. But it, it sounds like until... you took to American childhood pretty pretty well, pretty quickly. I did, man. I did. Some, some like good Captain Crunch cereal in the morning. Pop tarts and watching some Saturday morning cartoons. Nothing like growing up in the '90s, but it, it really what did it for me was watching the enthusiasm that my parents had when big soccer tournaments would come around, like the World Cup, the Copa America, and the Gold Cup, and just how much they loved the Mexican national team. My mom would go crazy; like she wouldn't watch any other any other soccer games, but when Mexico played, she would just be in front of the TV talking shit, uh, cheering the players on. But yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was really my dad too, who would look, uh, he, he pushed me to really watch these games and to pay attention to them and, uh, that I should care more about Mexico winning than video games. And, uh, so my parents, along with their friends lived and breathed, uh, soccer. And, and so, yeah, so I, I grew up loving soccer more and more. And in due, due to a large part of it being connected to my cultural identity and wanting to celebrate my Mexican roots, I started 
playing soccer in high school. And I'll never forget our high school friends thinking that we can get into the Mexican league and do really well um, against all the other guys because we were young and we thought we had youth on our side, but we got destroyed that season. We didn't win a single game. Yeah, don't mess with the old guys. No, no. I learned that lesson. Yeah, like guys with beer bellies and they wouldn't even warm up. They would just destroy. And so... I think I play against some of those guys myself now in, in my Sunday league. <laughs> to this league. day, yeah. They've still been playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like you know your family really instilled that that pride and that passion for supporting you know the Mexican national team, especially in those big tournaments as a kid. I can certainly attest to your parents' love of the Mexican national team. I know we've met up with them a little uh, a couple times up in yep. Greeley for some USA-Mexico matchups. Mike, did you want to... I did want to ask a question because you touched upon something that is maybe one of my favorite parts of the sport of soccer, which is you talked about the language barrier. Mm. And and Colin and I have lived abroad and had to deal with language barriers as well. Obviously, not to the extent as you have. But yeah. one of the things that we always found while in foreign places is a language of soccer yep. and being able to communicate with people through the sport and even if you don't have the like linguistics to be able to communicate, you could still go to a pitch and play Mm -hmm. and no one's really got to interact with you. You can shout, you can yell in whatever language and you know, those pickup games can be, you know, pretty easy to insert yourself. So kind of explain that because I think that to me is like one of my favorite parts about the sport. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, I think that's honestly one of the biggest reasons I love soccer is football is for that reason too. It made coming to the States as immigrants, very welcoming, you know, because we could transcend language barriers and connect through because of the sport with other folks in in our small town. And it was so much fun to do so too. And it was such a great way to bond uh, over a shared common interest, you know. Every Saturday we would barbecue and the grownups would have beers, they would have chelas, and then we would play pickup soccer. And so we'd be out there playing. And, and then a, a lot of people, random people would just come and just join us and play. And so it became, it became a, something we did weekly. But you're so right. Like I, I moved to Denver in 2008 and started to go to college. And one of the things that made living in a new city away from my family so easy was playing soccer, was playing pickup soccer across the city. Um, and one of my favorite places was at Washington Park. And I, I, it was, it was amazing. I met people from all over. One of the organizers, his name was Nazir. And uh, he would bring the goals. Everyone loved him because he would bring some pug goals and people would wait for him. And when he would show up, you knew the game was about to get started. So you better lace up and get a spot. Um, but he would always pray. He was Muslim, so he would always pray right before. And, you know, in that area of town, it's like Southeast Denver. It's super pretty wealthy and white. Um, but to see so many cultures playing soccer uh, was super cool. And to be a part of it was super cool. Um, and another story I'll share too was the one time, the, the only, the one other time that I felt like I had uh, when it came to the language barrier, I really experienced it was when I was in Italy. Um, I studied abroad in Italy and our landlord was Italian and he invited me to go play soccer with his Italian buddies in in like rural outside of Bologna where I was living. And I didn't know any Italian. These guys just, I mean, even though I didn't speak the language, we connected over soccer. And and then, th- and then this is a bit of banter too. And uh, when I was in Italy, these do pick up, but in Bologna, you pay a certain amount to, per hour to play pick up. And this Australian guy was like, you're lucky you're Mexican because we usually don't let Americans play soccer, <laughs> play pickup soccer with us. So just a uh, little banter for you all U.S. fans. Mexicans have a little bit of a better reputation abroad. <laughs> That doesn't really surprise me, but, you know, I'm glad that, uh, you know, you were able to shed the American stigma uh, abroad. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but that kind of, you know, I'm that kind of, that kind of like leads to that question that I was going to ask in the, in the front, which is, you know, what is it like being a Mexican fan in the United States, right? Like mm-hmm. that's got to be a very different experience than say being in Mexico and, and, and just being a fan there. Yeah, definitely. I think for me, I feel like it's it goes back to what's something I said earlier was like 
my connection and relationship with the Mexican soccer team is very much uh, from a place of wanting to celebrate my roots because I feel like there's so many ways that you integrate into U.S. society and you, you're you often not in spaces where your culture is celebrated. And so that was my way of, of celebrating my culture was through being an ardent Mexico fan, celebrating every soccer player, every Mexican soccer player that would go abroad or was doing really well in the MLS. Colin and I met when I was managing a youth soccer program for Latino youth. A lot of, a lot of Mexican youth um, that don't really have access to competitive soccer because it's so expensive in the States. And so that was my own experience too, is not being able to afford to play club soccer. So I played pickup soccer and played high school soccer, but it still wasn't the same. Like I remember being in high school and seeing all the, all the, the varsity team often, you knew who was going to be on varsity because they also played club together. And for kids that didn't have access to that, it was a little hard to take in um, that you probably wouldn't get a chance. But being but being on the on the other end and being able to invest in other Mexican kids to be able to have the opportunity to play competitive soccer was super cool. And I think it speaks to a, a, a larger issue in the States in terms of access and opportunities for, to uh, youth soccer, which the sooner you get your kids into youth soccer, the higher the chances of them developing a love for the sport. Um, I mean, not that you can't develop a love for the sport later on, but the the higher the chances of you developing into a great soccer player will be. So yeah, so there's that. And then I think, um, yeah, I would say the other part is it's really interesting. My brother, he was born in the States. He's a uh, he likes to poke the bear <laughs> um, at our house. And so he's a U.S. He is, he's a big US, USA fan. Um, he's always rooting for the other team. But I feel like it's also made it so that it's, it's a fun rivalry. It's like uh, it's been unfortunate that the U.S. has beat Mexico the last few years. But I also feel like I it's think it's been, been great. <laughs> yeah, I, I've loved you it, know. actually. <laughs> Maybe you can disagree, we can agree to disagree, but um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, on it, I mean, it, it was bound to come. I feel like Mexico, Mexico got tired of winning all the time, you know, and so <laughs> I think it's good for the region too. Is your brother the black sheep of the family, or is the house truly divided? Is he just the only one that is a U.S. fan? He's the only one. He's he's the only U.S. fan. But it's interesting though. Um, I was talking to my dad recently. One of my favorite memories of my dad um, when it comes to Mexican soccer was uh, we were in Mexico uh, when Mexico played Chile in the Copa America and we lost the infamous 7-0 uh, game and we got destroyed. And I had never seen my dad so pissed. And on the way home, he just threw his Chicharito jersey on, uh, into the street <laughs> and then ran home. <laughs> He was like, he, he was like, he's, they were always disappointing us. And so. Hmm. Sorry, Javier. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> and I was talking to him uh, uh, yeah, a few days ago and he's like, they still haven't, haven't fully uh, won him back. And so. So I want to back up a little bit, Felipe, you know, you mentioned your support of the Mexican national team resting pretty strongly on that connection back to, you know, I think connecting to your roots was the phrase you used. Mm hmm. I don't want you to speak for an entire country, but I've been trying to figure this out for years. Is that is that the secret sauce? Because every time I go to a USA Mexico game or I'm in a city where the Mexican national team is playing, it doesn't have to be against the US. They've actually hosted some home games in the US themselves. Mm -hmm. The Mexican fans absolutely dominate the US fans. Mm -hmm. What is that about? I mean, is it is it that support, that connection to the roots again, or? Uh, I would say it's a little bit of that for sure. I think, I think when you go to Mexico, like they're so, I mean, it's the biggest sport in Mexico. The rivalries gets really intense. I'm sure you heard, you heard recently what happened with uh, one of the Mexican soccer teams. I think Atlas um, was involved. Querétaro, there's Querétaro fans, but they take it very seriously. And, and so I think, I also think we have uh, over the years, built this idea in our heads that we're the best in North America for probably, I mean, for good reason, you know, um, 
And I feel like it comes with a bit of pride and eagerness to see your team continue to win once you've tasted it. And so I think that also has a lot to do with it because soccer is very, it's a powerful force in Mexico. And so when we're, we're still, we're still uh, hoping to prove ourselves on the world stage. Like when the world cup comes around, we keep saying that we want the fifth game. Like, but yeah, so I guess it's a little bit of ego, a little bit of passion, a little bit of um, all the above. Well, I think speaking of rivalries and, and you talked about this a little bit before, which is how Mexico was always winning back in the day, right? The U S team wasn't really holding up their end of the, uh, the rivalry. Like, do you think today where we are, it actually is a legitimate rivalry, whereas maybe it wasn't previously? I think it's always been a really strong rivalry. Um, you know, I, I feel like we very much have come out on the, the winning side quite a bit. Um, but I think it's always it's always been there. I feel like for social, political reasons, I think Mexico likes. Yeah, I think we do view the U.S. as our biggest rival. Um, I'm just thinking of the the Landon Donovan days, the Tim Howard. Uh, I'll never forget that that goal that Gio, Gio Dos Santos scored on uh, Tim Howard uh, outside of the box with that chip. Um, but I think I think the rivalry's just gotten more intense. I also think it has a lot to do with this the the talent that is across the USA team and also the identity crisis that I feel like I feel like we're we're in somewhat of an identity crisis because I mean we're we're fa- we phased out uh, Chicharito, uh, we phased out Carlos. Thank Vera. goodness. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, he was a he was a constant thorn on on your all side, and Carlos Vela is still doing amazing stuff in MLS. He just scored a hat trick, but it's really interesting. I feel like we're you all are very much on top as you've sh- proven in in the last three matches that we face you all. Um, and I feel like Mexico is, we're in a bit of a existential crisis of, you know, where do we, where do we go from here in terms of the losses, the phasing out of former stars, Tata Martino is also a very defensive minded coach. And so how does, how does that fit with what fans and or what has traditionally been the, the flair of the Mexican team in terms of being atta- an attacking, uh, a strong attacking side? So it's, yeah. Hey everyone, we hope you're loving the show. If you are, we'd love it if you showed us your love. Here's a couple simple ways to do that. Be sure to hit subscribe or follow wherever you're listening to this episode. Even better, send this episode to a friend and tell them to listen as well. If you happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, We'd love it if you'd leave us a star rating and write a review for us. It's a great way to help others discover our show. Finally, engage with us on Instagram. Follow, like, tag, or DM the Footy Travelers handle, at Footy Travelers. As always, if you want more info on anything you hear about in our episodes, check out the show notes, or reach out to us through the contact page on FiperMedia.com. All right, back to the show. So, I, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Felipe, but it sounds like you might agree with, you know, an argument I've heard recently in that, you know, U.S. player development has pushed past that of Mexico. You know, some might point to the presence of our players on clubs like Barca or Juventus or Chelsea or Dortmund, you know, you know, Mexico's got some players on Wolves and Napoli and Porto, but. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think the one thing I will say to that, though, is that I feel like what Mexico has though, is that we always prove to play as a collective. That's why we've done well oftentimes against big teams like Brazil, uh, Germany, um, is that we're able to, we're able to play as a unit, but I I will give you that, that you all have pushed um, in terms of development uh, beyond us. Your, your options are incredible. Pulisic at Chelsea, um, Gio Reyna, Dortmund, a lot of other really promising stars, McKenney and Juve. And when I think of Mexico, a lot of cr- criticism Mexican players uh, are getting to is when they go to Europe. Like I think of Diego Lainez. He's one of my current favorite players. 
he sits on the bench <laughs> at Betis in, this, in La Liga, and they're actually doing really well. They're in the top four. Uh, they're pushing Barca for that fourth spot. But whenever they play, I, I look them up, I look up the lineup, and sure enough, Diego Lainez is always on the bench. So I think I think we'll get there. I think we'll yeah. I think we'll 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 uh, continue being strong rivals, and I'm hopeful about our youth development. Well, let's um let's step away from the sport a little bit. You know, I think one of the things we really love doing with this podcast and having guests on is using the sport as a way to connect, but then getting to know our guests more for who they are outside of that sport. So, Felipe, you know, tell us a little bit who you are just beyond, you know, a Mexican national team supporter. What do you, what do you got going on in your life that you're excited about? Definitely. Um, no, I appreciate that. My background is in advocacy and community organizing. So I've done a lot of nonprofit work, working on local issues from school funding to transportation equity issues to tackling payday loans um, and climate issues. And so, so yeah, so that that's bit of, a bit of my background. I've also had the chance to manage that youth soccer program where I got to meet you and really loved it. And so tried to stay involved with the sport. So uh, I'm not coaching now, but I've coached before with uh, rec leagues. And I have a dog. His name is Osito. He's a that big little bear. He's mound dog, German Shepherd mix. Yeah, a little bear. Yeah, it's, it's pretty funny considering he's like 90 pounds out. But yeah, I most recently, something I'm really excited about is my brother and two other good friends. We started a outdoor food and beverage company um, with the mission to diversify the outdoors through culturally authentic, delicious and spicy Latin food. And we launched a Kickstarter last year and raised 20k and went into production in the in the over the summer and in the fall and most recently hosted our launch party and had over a hundred people there, which was super fun. I think we've I we definitely identified a need in the outdoor space. I could go for some flavorful meals. I know the ones I get are kind of kind of gross. And you're in the epicenter <laughs> for it, right? I mean, the amount yeah. of oh yeah, uh, you know, the audience and demographic yeah. in Colorado and the Denver area. I mean, I feel like you really can't be a resident unless you are someone that is an outdoors man or woman and going to need some of those food packs. Exactly. Yeah, honestly, that's we're we're very fortunate to be in Colorado and and really excited. I think um it was it was super cool to run with an idea. Um, we got the idea a year and a, like a year and a half ago on a backpacking trip where we had some of that flavorless, not so tasty, de- dehydrated meals. That space food. Just, yeah, <laughs> space food. And so we just, we were like, there's got to be, you know, there's got to be better options. And we did research and there, I mean, there is, there is Latin food, but it's a lot of it. It's tokenized Latin food. I mean, Taco Bell is pretty good but it's not real authentic. Like the food that I grew up with that my abuelita, my grandma uh, would make us, you know, some like good pozole, some uh, enchiladas, huevos rancheros. And so we just ran with the idea and uh, yeah, we're, we, we, uh, it came to fruition. And so we're trying to, we're doing a seed round of funding, trying to scale. And we were in the, we're one of the finalists for this Moose Jaw Outdoor Brand Accelerator Program. That's, that would really do do us really well. And so, so tell us what uh, what is the name of the company and where can people go to to find out more about it or even I don't know if they can order stuff. Is it in stores um, yet? It, you can order. You can place a pre order. We're doing another second. We're doing a second pre order on our website. You can go to alsomeals dot com. I hear also. Yeah, let Osito. me let me quiet him down because he's a loud drinker. Osito, go, go. He's so inefficient when he laps water into his mouth. (laughs) And so I feel like most bears are probably, I don't know. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, you can, you can go on our website. Also meals.com. Sweet. And that's OSO. OSO meals. And you can order, we have four meals currently available. Pozole, huevos rancheros, a veggie enchilada and a enchilada bowl. That sounds incredible. So you talked about how this idea came about while you were backpacking and since this is called not just the footy show, this is the footy travelers mm. podcast. So we want to talk a, a little bit about travel. So 
what would you say is the best travel destination in Mexico that perhaps no one really knows about? Maybe a little hidden gem. Tell us your secrets, Felipe. Yeah, I would say a hidden gem that I would love people to go explore is called Batscuero. It's in Michoacan. And if you guys are ever down to go visit my family in Michoacan, happy to host you all. But Done. it's <laughs> it's uh it's beautiful. It's like colonial. <clears throat> the architecture is very colonial, Spanish colonial, and it's very magical. It's it's uh, uh known as a pueblo mágico, uh magic town in Mexico, and it's known for Dia de los Muertos. So they do an amazing. I've I've only ever been once, and it was probably one of the most magical places I've ever been to. There's an ofrenda, an altar everywhere you look. They the they light up. They do an amazing Dia de los Muertos night where it's just incredible. They do a whole uh they do a whole parade. They do face painting. It's it's just a great cultural experience. And that's not even the half of it. So like there's Batscuero and then there's also an island that you can get ferried from Batscuero. It's called Isla De Janitio. And if you see some, if you go online and Google Google Isla de Janitio or uh, Isla de Janitio, Dia de los Muertos, you see pictures of the island just lit up with candles. Um, and it's it's beautiful. The island was already beautiful, is already beautiful during the day. And even if it's not Dia de los Muertos, and Batscaro is too, but it just added on even more so. And the food is amazing. The drinks are amazing. The last time my family and I went, we went to a coffee shop in Batscaro and got super drunk over pulque they have i don't know if you both have, tr- have ever tried pulque but it's it's really good pretty uh, it's pretty strong uh but super tasty and it's it's definitely an experience well it it, it sounds like the three of us need to take a trip to yeah. mexico go to a game at the azteca go to pazcuaro and then we drink drink some, some what? pulque Hold on, okay. I need to add to that though, because I've been wanting to go to Dia de los Muertos for like ever, and <laughs> I always thought that you had to go to Mexico City to do it. But these no. recommendations are like, and I honestly was considering it, maybe trying to do it this year, but obviously with the World Cup in the fall and stuff, mm. it could be a little bit tricky. But mm. you've got me you've got all these ideas going now because it's such a typical idea to celebrate that holiday in Mexico City. It's like yeah. the one place that everyone like kind of thinks of when that holiday happens, yep. but you forget that everyone celebrates it across the country. It's not just that city. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's also, it's every, every city is you, they have their own way of celebrating it. Uh, on that same trip that I went to the other Los Muertos in Pátzcuaro, I also went to Mexico city. And even if you go to Mexico city and not go to, go to Pátzcuaro, you'll still have a great time. Like Mexico city, their parade is amazing. I have some really cool videos of 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 like there was a there was a whole band. One of my favorite groups in the parade was this band of women playing the drums, and it was in, it's, it was super intense. But they all had their they all had their calavera mask on, and so it's incredible. But you should I think you're you definitely have more options. Like I've heard Oaxaca does an amazing Dia de los Muertos, but you can definitely go other places. Well, speaking of travel, guys. You know, Mike, you just mentioned the World Cup. Let's uh, let me ask you this, Felipe, as a lead into uh, some of our rapid fire questions. World Cup 2022 in Qatar. Are you attending? Why or why not? Uh, that's the goal. I'll be there. Yeah, I it will be my first World Cup and I am excited to see Mexico. But I also feel like it's it's uh, going to be an end of an era for a lot of players that I follow and, and uh, are inspired by like. It'll probably be Messi's last World Cup. It'll probably be if if Portugal make it past Italy, it'll probably be Ronaldo's last World Cup and so, and several other other players. And so so that is the goal. That is one of my rapid fire questions, which is if there is a non Mexican player that you support that you wish could maybe somehow find some lost heritage and come <laughs> back to and come back to Mexico to come play for L three. Who would it be? Would it be Messi? Would it be Ronaldo or someone else? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say, wow. I would say, honestly, I've been really into, I'm a huge Real Madrid fan. And so, which is why I root for Ronaldo. But if I if I had to choose a player that is on fire right now, it would have to be Modric. I can't believe he's 36 and he's the, <laughs> the engine of Raw. What he did against... Uh, PSG. 
It's just- and, and yes, Benzema is did, did incredible too. But Modric is just something else. Like he is, he's a legend of a player. He's still bringing the fire from the last World Cup. Yeah. It's crazy. I've always been a fan of him, but I did not anticipate you saying that. And I love <laughs> that pick. So bravo to that answer. <laughs> Next one up, Felipe. Liga MX or MLS? Oh, man. I got to say MX. But I'm going to preface that with I think MLS is, is definitely getting there. Like I haven't experienced uh, a Liga MX game. And some of my favorite memories in soccer are at the Rapids on the rapid shuttle, the tailgate in, in the game. Um, but I think in terms of, of just talent, I think at Liga MX is still a little cut above. All right. Next question uh, is maybe an ode to one of my only favorite Mexican players. If Jorge Campos came out of retirement, would he make the starting roster on L3? Oh man, that's a hard. Uh, yes. I think you would. I think you would. Just on Pop's collars alone. <laughs> yeah. Nothing Black. nothing against Ochoa, but yeah, he's he's got he doesn't have the flair. Ochoa doesn't have the flair that Jorge Campos does. I think Ochoa just needs to, you know, just take a, a long look in the mirror and um ask himself why he's not as stylish as Jorge Campos. <laughs> and it's a good reference. Good then he reference would, Colin. He would know. Speaking of jerseys and style. Mike and I, we're kind of into footy kits and, and jerseys, and we will gladly admit this. Why is it that Mexican jerseys are typically just so much cooler than the U.S. men's national oh, team man. jerseys? It's that green and black. The color combo? Mm. Yeah, I would say the color combo in general. But uh, I feel like the I'm trying to think of the U.S. jersey right now. <laughs> well, if you can't think of it, then that means it's not that memorable. Yeah. If you looked at it too long, you might get dizzy too. Honestly, yeah. it looks like a jigsaw puzzle. I like it. I like it. It is a bit jigsaw puzzly, but I would say one of the things, and this is this is going to show my total nerdism of kits, but one of the things that I've always respected about the Mexican kit is that they often try to incorporate geometric patterns that are mm-hmm. found in the culture. Yeah. So yeah. like Azteca and, and those those elements like that are just sort of sprinkled into the kit just always, I look at them and I'm like, why can't we find a way to make that the thing? We always just have to lean towards like big stars and bars. And it's just like, don't we have any other cool geometric things in our culture? Yeah. Um, we we don't. We got rid of them all. <laughs> we don't. Oh, yeah. That's, that's yes. That's, we've either gotten rid of it or we've taken it from other cultures. Yeah. <laughs> hard truths, Mike. Spitting hard truths on the podcast. That's, that's another, uh, subject for another time. It's <laughs> a different show entirely. Uh, we'll keep on topic here real quick. Who would you say is Mexico's most hated U.S. men's national team player of all time? Of all time? I That's a hard one. I feel like... Or or yours. Or who, who do you not like? Who do you loathe? Who, who do you not really enjoy seeing score on you a lot? <laughs> or save. Or saving, saving your penalty yeah. kicks. Honestly, I don't know. Pulisic. He's yeah. I would say when you when you asked the question, he was the first person that came to mind, just because he's been so good recently, recently. So, but uh, okay. of all time, I mean, he's still pretty young, so he might be he might be that person. Speaking of young players, I think one that has been on the come up that a lot of people have talked about as being kind of dynamic in opinion is Ricardo Pepe. Do you, do you love him? Do you hate him? Do you, are you kind of neutral? I would say I'm neutral. I feel like I am neutral because I'm so, I feel like he still has yet to prove himself. Like he's done really well. I think he had a great debut and he's had some really good games for the USA, but he hasn't, I don't think he's been, he hasn't been that much of a thorn yet. And so I feel like I'm still waiting to see more of him. So Oh, I just remember the guy. Do you do you all remember Kobe Jones? Oh yeah, his favorite he, Colin's favorite player. Yeah, he's my favorite player of all time. He's the single reason why I love the number thirteen and why I went to dreadlocks. As a well, kid. there you go. Same. That's that's one of I would say one of the most hated players of all time. He's one of the architects. I feel like of the Dos Acero. and I'll never forget when Rafa Marquez and him just went went into it. <laughs> I remember those were the the first few games of the Mexico USA rivalry that I loved watching. Yeah. Just they got me into it. Yeah, 
We talked about food a little bit earlier. Salsa verde or salsa roja? Salsa verde. Good choice. Salsa I love it. Verde. I can't say that I consistently ask this question of um, fans of the Mexican national team, but I have always found it to be one that is lighthearted and somewhat humorous. Um, and the question is, is there a methodology or a best practice to pissing in a water bottle that will inevitably be thrown or poured or dumped on a U.S. national team player that all the Mexicans abide by? Don't answer that, Felipe. Do not incriminate <laughs> no, yourself. I'm going to say, you know, I can't, I, Plead I can't the fifth. say, I can't say, you know, I think that is, yeah, <laughs> it's a good question, but <laughs> I will, yeah, I will pass. Yes, I think that's a respectful uh, uh, plead the fifth. No comment. <laughs> well, on, on that note, gentlemen, we are recording this ahead of the USA-Mexico game. We will, I believe, be releasing it just the day after. Let's see how our predictions turned out. Felipe, what do you got? Give me a scoreline. 1-0 Mexico. Mike? I'm, uh, I'm going to say 1-1 because I just don't know if the U.S. can pull out a win in Azteca for maybe arguably the last competitive match that we have for maybe a long, long time. And it also selfishly, I don't want us to get all of the points to qualify because I'd like to be at the match in Orlando that we are going to against Panama to actually qualify, make that be the clincher. So selfishly, I'm saying 1-1. So selfish, but also very, very even. <laughs> you know, I, I've seen U.S. teams, young U.S. teams come in with a lot of energy, get fired up for the Azteca away match, score early. Um, but yeah, whether or not they can hold on to it, I might say 2-1 Mexico, two to one. be honest. But definitely not a dos a cero. None of that. <laughs> well, Felipe, this has been awesome. Thanks so much for joining us on the pod today. Um, you know, I definitely hope you don't have great success in your next game <laughs> as a as a Mexican national team supporter. But uh, beyond that, love having you as a friend. Glad we can connect and glad you got to meet Mike. Yeah, yeah. likewise. Man. Yeah, We're, appreciate you as a friend and great to meet you, Mike. You as well. We I'm sure that we will have uh, some times to share together. I'll, I'll be coming back out to Denver soon and we'll plan out that that trip to Mexico because I'm holding you to it. Colin will, Colin will be uh, the person yeah. to be, to, to explain to you that when someone offers a trip or something that's, you know, more immersive in the culture rather than just yeah. like, Hey, let's go somewhere. I'm like, yep. Sign me up. I'm in. Hey man. I love that. Mike, Mike's a yes guy. <laughs> it's always good to say yes to adventure. And so, but, uh, but no, I love you, Colin. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, great to meet you, Mike. I'll see you if not in Colorado and Mexico or in the world cup. Yes. Yeah. We've got plenty of places to meet up. I'm excited. And listeners, hopefully we see you on our new Instagram page at footy travelers. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Go check out Felipe and his brother Marcos and their friends, osomeals.com and uh, get yourself some tasty adventure food. Till next time, everyone. Take care. The Footy Travelers podcast is a production of Fiper Media. To learn more about their other work, visit fipermedia.com. That's F-Y-P-E-R media.com. Our episodes are edited by me, Colin Martin. Mike Tyrone is our creative director. Cover art is by Felix Palau. Theme music comes from Shumatar, with additional music from Mr. Mastermind. Our incredible intro voice is Helen My Mars. You can keep up with all things footy travel by following us on Instagram, at footy travelers. We'll see you next time.